This is a program by Global Voices for Justice. Hi, my name is Mansur Saba. I'm director of Global Voices for Justice. We are a nonprofit media organization based in Long Beach, California, and we've been doing this for 10 years. Um, all of our all of our programs are educational, including this talk by Ilan Pape. If you'd like to get a copy of this talk, or if you'd like to make a contribution to our nonprofit organization, you can reach us by phone as well at 310-283-0885. That's 310-283-0885. Let's watch the first part of two parts of talk by Ilan Pape and help us to get the word out about this type of programming. Thanks for watching. Uh, I will uh, try and provide uh, uh, two kinds of lectures in one ticket. Uh, one uh, would be a very general uh, remarks which will envelop the main uh, lecture that would preface the main uh, historical narrative I would like to share with you. Uh, and I will come back to that general introduction when I finish my historical narrative. And the main body of my lecture would be indeed revisiting 1967 on the basis of a new research I'm conducting uh, um, in the wake of the declassification of new documentation in the Israeli archives, among other archives in the area er, and in the world, that I think give us a new perspective of what happened in 1967 and after 1967. Let me begin by saying that I am both an activist and an academic, and as such, I do not forget for a moment that as an academic, as much as I could be a challenging person, as much as I would like to challenge, for instance, today in this lecture, the uh, framing of a conflict, the discourse that is used to describe and analyze uh, the conflict, I do not forget for a moment that uh, the power of framing, representation, and discourse is not exactly the same potent power as oppression and counter-oppression. However, I do believe that the way an oppression is presented, represented, and misrepresented is an important part of its success. And a successful challenge to this representation or misrepresentation is also an action uh, that is part of the overall attempt to bring an oppression uh, to an end. So uh, with this, some sort of humility about the importance of words uh, and how a reality is described through these words, uh, I would like to uh, uh, continue in this uh, vein. The framing I will challenge, and I'm not the first one to do it, and looking at some familiar faces in the audience. I'm not the only one even in this room to do this. But the framing which is worth challenging and reminding ourselves of is the one that frames the relationship between Israel and the Palestinians as uh, a human interaction that can be best solved and managed through something that is called the peace process. There's a certain uh, there are certain pre-assumptions about a peace process, and one of the important one of them is a parity, that you have two sides with almost an equal share and blame in creating the conflict that you want to solve. Uh, you can divide the claim, the, sh the, 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 the claim, the blame, the area, the conflict in very in different ways. Uh, uh, the uh, former Secretary of State, uh, Maudlin Albright, used to say that in cases, and she's a very uh, uh, famous supporter of this paradigm that I'm trying to challenge, she used to say the best way to approach a problem like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would be to look at everything which is visible and, and make it divisible. 
So you divide uh, territory, you divide resources, you divide history and present, and you divide uh, blame. And of course, you create in that action of division, you don't create a parity. Because immediately, when you begin to divide, one side becomes more responsible, the other less responsible. One side becomes more of a positive actor on the stage. The other one becomes a bit more negative. Now, of course, and I will come back to that in the end of my talk, in the case of the Palestinians, this totally disempowered them. The very fact that they were supposed to be acting with is within this frame, within this mindset, that they are part of a peace process. The moment they, uh, they became part of a peace process, uh, and the peace process had very little to offer them, and they had very little share in framing it and formulating its agenda, from the very beginning, and this can easily be shown historically, they were a negative actor on the stage of peace. But there was no other stage on which they could have performed. And this disempowerment, this, this uh, weakening, this disadvantaging of the Palestinian, I think is something that has to be handled uh, in more than one way. Uh, and the best way that I could come up with is the way of offering a different language, a different dictionary, a different paradigm for looking at what happened in Israel and Palestine and what is really the essence of the effort to change the oppressive and violent reality on the ground. So if you do not accept the frame, the discourse of a peace process, of a conflict even, you have to look for something else. And that something else, I think, uh, I hope, would uh, emerge from my historical narrative because I choose to challenge this idea that what you need in Israel and Palestine is a peace process, or what you need in Israel and Palestine is to recognize the responsibility and agency of both sides if you want to bring an end to violence. I want to challenge this and replace it by something some of you are familiar with, of course, with the idea of an oppression, an op of a paradigm that describes the reality in the past and in the present as one that exists between an oppressor, an oppressed, a colonizer, and a colonized, an ethnic cleanser, and a cleansed, and, um, and a, uh, a victimizer, and a victim. And I think in the relationship between such actors on a stage, regardless whether this is in individual relationship between human beings, or between nations, or between political groups, when you have that kind of imbalance, when you have that kind of disparity inbuilt into the reality, what is called the peace process, the discourse of peace, the discourse of a conflict, totally of obfuscates the uneven relationship between the victim and the victimizers. In order to end a victimization, you need something else. You don't need peace. You don't need uh, to look at it as a conflict. You need to bring an end to the victimization. Sometimes peace is one means of doing it. Sometimes it's not the only means of bringing an end to an oppression. In this case, colonization, dispossession, and ethnic cleansing. And I would like to go back to 1967 as an historian because the paradigm of parity, the paradigm of looking at the reality in Israel and Palestine as a conflict, looks at 1967 as the departure point of the conflict. and looks at the territories that Israel occupied in June 1967 as the only geographical space in which the conflict rages, and hence the only problem that has to be solved in order to bring peace to Israel and Palestine. And I think it's worthwhile going to that juncture in history and ask the question again, what are we really watching in Israel and Palestine, and what is the best way forward to end the violence on the ground? So let me go back to 1963, actually, not 1967. Givat Ram, 
the hill of Ram, is a wide hilly spread on the very western corner of present-day Jerusalem. It is inhabited by various ministries, the Knesset, part of the Hebrew University, and the National Bank of Israel. Israelis of a certain age, ethnic origin, and socioeconomic background developed a very nostalgic attitude towards the place. The hill makes a very brief and pastoral appearance in Amos Oz's first and famous novel, My Michael, published in 1968, where it says, where a small herd of sheep graze alongside the prime minister's office. There are no sheep inside today, and the grazing fields of yesteryears are long gone. They were replaced by an elaborate system of highways, metal gates, hanging bridges, and quite a beautiful rose garden. It is very unlikely that sheep were to be seen anywhere near the prime minister's office when Oz's book was published in 1968. But sheep did graze the hill when the Palestinian rural neighborhood, Sheikh al-Badr, was standing there. Few of its houses are still there today, next to the Crown Plaza Hotel, frequented by Israeli members of Knesset who do not live in Jerusalem. This village was gradually swollen by the city and became in an urban neighborhood until it was ethnically cleansed by Israeli forces in 1948. It was a famous spot in the city as it overlooked one of Jerusalem's most renowned landmarks, the Valley of the Cross. Tradition has it that there stood the tree providing the wood for Christ's Christ cross, and this is why on that alleged spot, Greek Orthodox monks built an impressive uh, monastery. Still there today, caged between new Jewish neighborhoods and inlay roads. West of the monastery today lies one of the two main campuses of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. It is built on Sheikh al-Badr's confiscated land, sold to the university by the Israeli custodian of absentee lands, allegedly kept pending a decision about its future, but in reality sold to any Jewish individual or enterprise willing to pay a ridiculous low price for it. The university until 1948 operated on Mount Scopus, which became a no man's land and therefore inaccessible. North of the new built campus, and roughly at the same time, a new site for the Israeli government was erected. Whereas the buildings of the campus were modest in appearance and were soon covered by pleasant lawns and greenery, it seems that the serene charm of this hilltop did not inspire the architects who built the governmental site of the Jewish state. With very little attention to the pastoral scenery or the biblical heritage, they opted for huge lumps of cement spread all over the hill, wounding the natural beauty of this crest of the Jerusalem mountains. In the summer of 1963, a group of unusual students were enrolled into this campus for two weeks course. They were almost all with legal background of one sort or another. Some of them were members of the military administration that was running the areas in which the 1948 Palestinians lived under a strict rule that robbed them of most of their basic rights, the military rule. Others were officers in the legal section of the Israeli army or officials of the Ministry of Interior, and there was one or two private lawyers. They were invited by the Department of the Political Science in the Hebrew University. It was a month-long course and included lectures on military rule, the political situation in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, the lessons to be learned from Israel's military rule in Sinai and the Gaza Strip in 1956, and inside Israel since 1948. A short introduction to Islam was also part of the curriculum, and it ended with a lecture on the 1948 ethnic cleansing of Jerusalem, the Yevusi operation of April 1948, in which scores of Palestinian villages were expelled and wiped out including the one on which the Hebrew University campus was built on. This was followed by, and I quote, a celebratory meal and everyone was in an excellent mood, reported one of the participants. This, their presence on Givat Ram in 1963 was part of an overall new military strategy initiated by the Israeli chief of the general staff. The strategy was presented by the COGS, the chiefs of general staff, to the army on May the 1st, 1963, and was meant to prepare the army for the need to run the West Bank as an occupied military area. Later on, they included the Gaza Strip as such an objective. The West Bank, of course, was not yet occupied in 1963, but the fact that four years before the actual occupation, 
the Israeli military was ready with a judicial and an administrative infrastructure for ruling the lives of one million Palestinians is highly significant. The plan was called named the Shaham Plan, and it divided the West Bank to eight districts for the purpose of facilitating the imposition of an organized military rule. Mikhail Shaham was the general military governor of the Palestinian territories inside Israel, and the official name of the program was, and I quote, the organization of the military rule in occupied territories. Three groups were behind the plan, members of the legal section of the army, academics of the Hebrew University, and official of the Ministry of Interior. The latter were mainly people who already served in, the, in one capacity or another in the military administration imposed on the 1948 Palestinians still intact in 1963. The plan included the appointment of a legal advisor to the future governor general of the occupied territories and the establishment of four military courts. Appendixes to the plan consisted translation into Hebrew of the Jordanian law and into Arabic of the 1945 mandatory regulations. Although the latter were used inside Israel, the Israelis for some reason did not possess their translation to Arabic. The reason may be that theoretically, according to the Israeli law, these draconian measures, of which more I will say a bit later, were imposed on Jews and non-Jews alike. In the case of the West Bank, it was meant to apply to Palestinians alone. And indeed, when the Jewish settlers would arrive, they would be exempted from this legal regime. Tzvi Inbar, who published for the first time the details of the plan in his memoirs, explains that every term had to be transferred from the reality of the mandatory period when these regulations were issued by the British government in 1945 to the prospective occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in 1963. Thus, the High Commissioner and His Majesty's government were irrelevant terms and were replaced by a general military governor and the IDF, respectively. Other materials in the plan indicate that the compatibility of international law and the Geneva Convention was of a concern in the case of the prospective occupation. Ominously for the Palestinians, the main concern was that the Geneva Convention did not permit executions. The Israelis would solve this problem by other means later on. The Jordanian law was studied as to know which of the laws would be immediately abolished and not to interfere, so as not to interfere with Israeli strategy and objective. Quote, it is impossible for us to leave a law which would be against Israel and grant it the, and grant it the legitimacy of an Israeli law, recollected in Bar. But otherwise, the mode of rule in the Jordanian period fitted well the Israeli conceptions of control. It was a comprehens as comprehensive as the Israelis wished it to be. It even included the censorship of books that could be read in the West Bank, especially by children. The Jordanian list included Anna Frank's diary. The Israeli one would include Thomas Kuhn, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, because it contained the word revolution. The Shaham plan also suggested names of people who should be appointed to the high post in the future occupation. Some of them would be there indeed in 1967, such as Chaim Herzog and the plan mastermind, Colonel Shaham himself. Under the term of the Shaham plan, another group of potential recruit was invited to the Hebrew University a year later. And in the next three years, the team was ready for the eventuality of a military occupation, which indeed came in June 1967. The various courses moved to Beta Chayal, the soldier's dormitory in Jerusalem. The composition of the courses and their main purpose was the same, to prepare for the eventuality of activating and managing a military rule in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. By May 1967, the plan became operative and the actual appointment of military governors and military judges to the West Bank and the Gaza Strip moved to a more detailed stage. It included also preparation for installing a regime in what the army called in Hebrew Syria. Syria. Each governor in May received a box, Argaz in Hebrew. Each box included instructions of how to govern an occupied Arab area. The Geneva and the Hague Conventions, the Arabic translation of the emergency regulation, and a lot of books 
that American jurists used when they occupied Nazi Germany. I don't want to give you all the list, but I have the list of the books that were there. Uh, and uh, I mention these books as they were either prepared before the occupation of Germany by the Americans or on the basis of lesson learned from that occupation. Although in hindsight, one can say that despite the elaborate preparation in practice, uh, an easier way was chosen, transferring the mode of rule according to the emergency regulation that were imposed on the Palestinians inside Israel between 1948 to 1966 and transplant them into the reality of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in 1967, rather than using the, the Hague Convention or the, Hague, or the Geneva Convention or these American manuals of how to, how to uh, manage Ger uh, Germany after the Nazi downfall. The Israeli interpretation of the mandatory regulation in 1948 as well as in 1967 gave unlimited control for a military governor over every aspect of life of the people in his area. The rulers became what the first head of the military rule regime in 1948, Colonel Elimelech Avner, described as an absolute monarchs in their own small domains. When they were first imposed in 1948, and later on in 1967, no one mentioned the fact that originally, when these regulations were introduced by the British mandate, they were condemned by all Zionist leaders as Nazi legislation. These leaders described them as regulation with, and I quote, no parallel in any enlightened country, unquote, and continued and said, and I quote, even in Nazi Germany, there were no such rules, and the actions of Majdanek and its like had been done out of violation of the written law, unquote. The two most notorious regulations were and still are 109, allowing the governor to expel the population, and number 110, 110, that gave him the right to summon any citizen to the police station whenever he so fit. Another infamous regulation was number 111, that sanctioned the administrative arrest and arrest for unlimited period without explanation or trial. This would become more a familiar feature of the 1967 occupation than the oppression of the Palestinians inside Israel. One practice that stemmed from an interpretation of several regulations was the right of governors to resort to preemptive measures, the most common of which was to declare a whole village or a whole neighborhood as closed military area, whatever the she whenever the Shin Bet, the Shabak, or the Israeli Secret Security Service had already knowledge of intention or of holding a meeting or a demonstration. This was first used in Israel in 1949 when the Palestinians in Israel were demonstrating, demonstrating against land expropriation. The mandatory emergency regulations stipulated the model for military courts, those venues through which millions of Palestinians would go through arrested without a trial, sent to torture and abuse, and only rarely pass them unsketched. Together with the books that told you how to run an occupied territory written by American jurists, they became the textual infrastructure on which the Israeli judiciary system in the occupied territories was founded. Courts had either one, two, or three judges. The three judges court had the right to order execution or send people for life imprisonment. Among the theoretical outfits envisaged in 1963 was also a special military court of appeal that would become operational in 1967. This never materialized. The boxes were hurriedly distributed in May and were given to a new unit called duly the Special Unit, which was attached to the occupying forces. The graduates of the course of Gina in Givat Ram were among them, and they took over the military judicial administration of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Zvi Indbar, for instance, was attached to the forces that occupied the Gaza Strip. In a matter of two days, he and others set up the military rule and the judiciary system in the Strip. The four years preparation made the takeover and the creation of a regime that would but in name remain intact for the next 45 years. What they contemplated, what they executed, and successive generations of Israeli bureaucrats maintained was the largest ever mega prison for a million and a half people who became four million, and who still today, in one way or another, are incarcerated within a real or imaginary walls 
if this jail. You have been watching part one of two part series of Elon Pape's talk on the false paradigm of parody and partition, revisiting 1967, uh, that was given on February 24, 2012 in Los Angeles, California. This is a program that's been brought to you by Global Voices for Justice, which is a nonprofit media organization based in Long Beach, California. If you'd like to make a contribution to our nonprofit organization, or if you'd like to receive a DVD copy of this talk or any of our other programs, you can reach us by our phone as well at 310-283-0885. That's again, 310-283-0885. Thanks for watching and check back for new programs posted regularly on our website.